I'm a moderator of uh, today's morning session. And uh, morning session, uh, we will have uh, two presenters. A first one <coughs> is uh, Professor uh, Bixby, and then after Professor uh, Four. So, uh, I'd like to introduce the academic background or profiles of uh, Professor Bixby uh, briefly. Uh, Dr. Robert Bixby has uh, a PhD in operations research from Cornell University. He has held academic positions at first at the University of Kentucky, then Northwestern University and Rice University. He is now Noah Harding Professor Emeritus of Computational and Applied Mathematics at Rice University, and also Research Professor of Management in Rice Jones School of Management. Dr. Bixby has published over 50 journal articles and is an acknowledged expert on the computational aspect of linear and integer program programming. He has won several awards for his work in op optimization, including the Bill Ocean Hayes Prize of the Mathematical Programming Society and the Informs Impact and uh, Frederick Lanchester Prize. In 1997, he was elected to the National Academy, uh, National Academy of Engineers, sorry, National Academy of Engineering for his contributions to the theory and practice of optimization. Dr. Bixby has over 20 years of experience in the optimization software business. He co-founded Ciprex Optimization in 1987. Ciprex was acquired by ILO in 1997, after which he served on the ILO Board of Directors, manager of the ILO Ciprex Development Team, president of the ILO Technical Advisory Board, and general manager of ILO's Semiconductor Business Division. So, oh, the today's title is The Optimization Toolbox is Supercharged. So, uh, we will invite his uh, presentation. Okay, please, let's start your presentation. big room and people were spread all over the place. Uh, let's see. Yes, that seems to work. Okay. So um, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to um, speak to you this morning. Um, and I hope I've sufficiently recovered from uh, jet lag that what I say will make sense. <laughs> um, the title of the uh, talk is The Optimization Toolbox, It's Supercharged. I think all of you will be aware that among the most important mathematical techniques available for applications in logistics are linear and integer programming. You may not be aware how much, really, the remarkable change in, in the last few years in the capabilities of these techniques to solve real-world problems. And that's really the theme of, of my talk. If, if it's been just five to six years since you've looked at this subject, you may have no idea what is really capable today. <coughs> 
So I hope by the time you leave this talk, you do have a sense of what's capable, what we're capable of. So here's a very brief outline. I'd like to begin with a historical perspective. And then I'd like to talk about where we are today, beginning with linear programming, which of course is a very well-known technique and is the foundation for much of what we do. But most of the real applications actually use mixed integer programming. And that will be the subsequent talk, topic that I talk about. And I'd like to conclude by giving you some case studies to illustrate some of the things that can be done today with these technologies. So here's the beginning of my uh, short history of this subject. Linear programming for most of us was introduced by George Danzig in 1947, right after the end of World War II. And you can argue that the introduction of linear programming was in large part motivated by logistics problems that were recognized in the military around that period of time. So at the very beginnings of this subject, logistics played, if you will, a key role. Another key aspect of, of, of what Danzig did was that in contrast to many of the economists of his day, who viewed linear programming as a subjective tool for understanding macroeconomic phenomena, Danzig had the act actually the idea that you could formulate real models and solve them and use the answer to make decisions. And that was perhaps a new thing. Consistent with that vision, he invented, proposed an algorithm for solving linear programming problems known as the simplex method or what he actually introduced is commonly called the primal simplex algorithm. He introduced this back in 1947 with a vision that it could be used, and this is before computers were actually available. Really rem involved remarkable vision, and it's also remarkable that this method that was invented so long ago, as you will see, is still a very useful, viable method for solving very large real-world problems. The first computer codes for linear programming, well, the first problem, actually, that was ever solved, as far as I know, using the simplex algorithm, was solved by an economist together with a team of graduate students. There was a problem with nine constraints and 77 variables, and it took them the equivalent of one person working for 120 days, roughly four months, using hand calculators. Four months to solve a linear programming problem with nine constraints and 77 variables. So that was a, 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 a very small beginning. The first computer codes code was written at the National Bureau of Standards in the US in 1951. By 1960, linear programming had started to become commercially viable. It was being used by principally by oil companies to do blending models and refineries. By the 1970s, mixed integer programming started to become commercially viable. And two of the big drivers for that were these two computer codes, MPSX 370, developed by IBM in the US, and the umpire code developed by a group in England that for the first time really made it possible to solve some interesting real world um, mixed integer programming problems. <coughs> this brings us then into the decade of the 70s. The subjects of linear programming and then integer programming are about 20 years old at this point. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of interest in these subjects in the 1970s. Uh, interest in large-scale planning models, many of them economic models for countries and for the whole world. This became a very popular kind of subject to look at. And funding, lots of research funding was available for this work. However, significant difficulties began to emerge. 
building an application, a real application to solve a real problem at that point was very expensive and very risky. It could take three to four years of development. And then the developers and application owners had to be multifaceted experts. Deploying an application was virtually impossible. So the person who built the application had to be a computer expert, they had to be a modeling expert, they had to be a mathematics expert. They owned the application, they ran the application. And the idea that you could take an application and make it available to users who weren't the developers was out of the question. All right? As a result, and, and the technology wasn't ready. Linear programs were still very hard to solve. People were solving problems with maybe a thousand variables, a thousand constraints. Uh, and mixed integer programming, in practice, even though in theory it sounded very good, in practice, it was a complete disaster. And this led to a great deal of disillusionment. <laughs> led basically to this view that there was a subject, mixed integer programming, which is the thing that we use so much today. It was a nice mathematical tool, but it was a toy. You could formulate problems, but in reality, you couldn't really solve any such problems. And that disillusionment, Actually, much of it still persi persists today from people who were, in my generation, trained around this period of time, who still view this technology as, you know, it's nice, but you can't solve real problems. And that simply could not be further from the truth. If you move into the decade of the 80s, around 19, just a, you know, a little personal perspective, around 1985 or so is when I got interested in myself in linear and integer programming computation. In the mid, whoops, in the mid 1980s, if you went to a, an operations research society meeting in the United States and talked to people, there was literally no interest in linear and integer programming. Everybody thought the subject was finished. That you couldn't do any better than these MPS X370 and MPS3 codes that were the mainframe codes that everybody was using at that point in time. There just was no interest in the subject. And then several important things or developments occurred in the 1980s. First, at the beginning of the 1980s, the IBM PC was introduced, which, of course, the PCs and Apple computers had existed before that, but it was the IBM PC that really brought desktop computing to industry for the first time. That's the beginning of the 80s. Relational databases were developed. The separation of logical and physical allocation of data, an incredibly important idea. And all of this somehow led to the development of ERP systems, which started to mean data became generally available. And optimization is completely dependent on the availability of data. Right? It requires huge amounts of data. Uh, Next, the first algebraic modeling languages were actually developed, which started to make it much, much easier to represent your mathematical programming models. The very first of those was GAMS, and of course Bob Forrest is, we'll talk about what might be viewed as the second or third generation of modeling languages. And finally, Karmakar, in, uh, in a famous 1984 paper, introduced the, or showed that interior point methods could be used in a practical way to solve linear programming problems. And this method had a, he showed that it had a polynomial time bound. Now, one of the interesting aspects of this subject is that these methods have, in fact, been demonstrated to work in practice, and they are, in fact, used, and they, they do influence the subject today. But in practice, actually, the, the simplex method, in spite of this, is still the dominant method for solving real-world linear programming problems. That said, this paper simply brought the subject back to life. There was all of a sudden an enormous amount of interest in this whole subject. Within a period of a few years, there were written over, by somebody's count, over 2,000 papers on linear programming in a subject that had a few years before that well, right about that time, had been considered to be dead. Right? So this led to a revolution, and 
brings me to the next part of my story. So from that period of time in the mid-80s to the present day, where are we first with linear programming? And I would like to illustrate that by showing you an example. This is a, um, a real-world production planning um, logistics model developed by a supply chain company. Um, it is, by today's standards, of moderate size. It's not what I would call extremely large. It's also not small. So it had a, about a half a million constraints and about one and a half million variables and close to 10 million non-zeros. What I did, and I did this testing, you can guess from the, the machine I was using here was a uh, Pentium 4 desktop. So this test was actually done around 2003, 2004. Right? And what I did was I took this model and I went back to the original version of the CPLEX code, version 1.0, that was released in 1988. I compiled it on this machine and ran it to solve this problem. And this is the result. It took, on that machine, it took 29.8 days. So I'm a very patient person. So the, uh, the good part is this demonstrated that version 1.0 of CPLEX was very robust. The bad news is it took a really long time. If you jump forward from 1988 to, to 1997, we're now up to CPLEX version 5.0, and this very same problem on the same machine solves in 1.5 hours. If you now jump forward to 2003 on the same machine, no difference in the machine, the same problem solves in under a minute, 59 seconds. And in fact, today, if I had access to this problem, which I do not anymore, you could probably solve it on my laptop that's sitting down, that's sitting up, it's sitting back here on this laptop, probably in about 20 seconds. This speed up alone is a factor of 40, over 40,000, and has nothing to do with the capabilities of machines. This is all in the same machine. And it's also inter interesting, those of you who know something about the algorithms and so forth may be wondering, this is actually, uh, I think this is the right thing to do, yeah. These are actually all just improved implementations of the primal simplex algorithm, Danzig's original algorithm. It got faster because we got smarter, because the data structures got better, because the mathematics got better for this method. So, this is just one problem. You can ask yourself the question, okay, what, what was true then for linear programs in general? How much progress had we made? And I wrote a paper about this in um, 2002, published in 2002, and I updated the results in 2004. This is an attempt to look at how much linear programming computation speed it had improved from 1988 to 2004. That's about one and a half decades, about 15 years. All right? And I attempted to do this test in the way that the previous slide suggested, so I tried to measure the effect of the algorithms, and separately the effect of the machines, and then in total, you get the overall effect over that period of time. And so what I measured for the algorithms over that period of time was an average speed up of about 3,300. Over that same time, and this is quite unusual, I measured the speed up in computing capability for desktop machines starting with a workstation, which I think was a Sun 3150, which is what I had on my desk in 1988, up to an appropriate PC in 2004 was a factor of about 1,600. So right away you see a, a phenomenon here that's quite unusual, namely that the, the mathematics, the science, the algorithms contribute more than the machines. To get the total speed up, you multiply those two things, you get this incredible number of a factor of five million. 
which if you want to try to put it in perspective, it's a little tough to put these things in perspective, but if you take two months and divide it by about five million, you get one second. So it, that, that, that speed up corresponds to two months turning into one second. And has, in fact, has totally revolutionized linear programming. If you, if you talk to practitioners who use linear programming in practice, they view linear programming as essentially a solved subject. They, the view of practitioners is basically that you can take black box linear programming solvers, build large linear programming problems, and solve them without worrying about it. It's a technology that's considered just in the toolbox, they're ready to use. Now, in my view, that's a little bit exaggerated, but that is, in, in fact, the view of many, many practitioners. So that's linear programming, which is the basis for the optimization methods that we use. The actual method that gets used in practice, typically, is mixed integer programming. So now let me talk about that for a while. Um, and let me check the time. Yes, I'm okay on time. You know these new these new um, th these kind of microphones are a um, especially for me are a what I would call a godsend. I gave a talk at, at a math programming conference in 19. My goodness, when was it? it? Was in Amsterdam. I forget when that was, but it was in Amsterdam anyway. Which last time I checked is in Holland. And uh, they didn't have this kind of thing, so they had this wire. They had a microphone and this wire that you walked around with. And I tend to walk back and forth and turn around and look this way. By the time the talk was over, I was wrapped in wire. <laughs> Standing on the edge of the stage with everybody afraid that nobody was listening to the talk anymore. Everybody was afraid I was going to fall over and hurt myself. And it, it was very close to happening. So fortunately, those times are gone. So here's a definition. This is, I think, probably the only real, anything close to mathematics that you will see in this talk. I thought I would just, for purposes of setting the context, that I would um, put up a definition of what a mixed integer programming problem is. It's an optimization problem of this form. In other words, if you, take an, if you cross out this bottom line, what you have is a linear programming problem. So a mixed integer programming problem is a linear programming problem plus the condition that some or all of the variables can take on integer values. By adding this last condition, you've taken a problem that's extremely well solved and extremely well understood for which we have scalable solution algorithms, and you've converted it into something that's NP-hard for which computer scientists would look at it and say, in practice, you can't expect to solve those problems. The computer scientists are wrong. You can solve them in practice, but we will come to that. The real thing that this does, by adding these variables, you turn this modeling paradigm into an extremely powerful tool for modeling decision problems. These integer variables, some of them can be 0, 1 variables. And you can use those variables to make decisions like, will I build a warehouse or not build a warehouse, where it makes no sense to build half a warehouse. That turns this whole modeling paradigm into an extremely powerful tool. So where are we with mixed integer programming today? I've, I've chosen one particular example, which I think illustrates nicely how the landscape has changed. Right, so this is, a, this is an example from a real consulting project that was carried out around 1996-1997. It involved a single consultant working for a single, working at a single company. The problem roughly described was a weekly model involving daily time buckets, and the objective was to minimize end-of-day inventory. So this was actually a beer bottling plant. And they wanted to make sure that as much of the beer that was bottled on a particular day was distributed out to their distributor warehouse locations. Um, production was at a single facility. Inventory was involved. They had shipping uh, conditions to deal with. They actually had a dedicated truck fleet. 
and shipping was taking place to wholesalers. The model had the nice feature, unusual in many cases, that the demand was actually known. So that simplified things a little bit. The initial modeling phase that the consultant um, embarked on was pretty typical of these kinds of things. Uh, he started out with a very simple prototype that had the main constraints of the problem, and then he added the complicating constraints, which involved fundamentally there were two categories of complicating constraints, production run grouping requirements, and so-called minimum truck constraints. Now, I really can't say too much about the details of these minimum truck constraints. It had something to do with the fact that it was a dedicated truck fleet, and they had union conditions that they had to deal with and so forth with the drivers that made it very complicated. The production run grouping requirement corresponded to the idea that once you started bottling things with a certain size bottle, you wanted to make sure you used that same size bottle for as long as possible because there was setup cost when you changed to a different size bottle. So those two things added complexity, and the result was a sort of a standard result. Namely, you build a model, it has everything in it that you want, and it's hopeless. All right? This model, they couldn't even get, they couldn't solve it to optimality, but they couldn't even get integer feasible solutions to the problem. So what they did is, is what is often done in practice. They developed a decomposition approach based on a very practical, simple idea. This was a real company. The company was running. It was doing something to manage its production and inventory and so forth. So they just went and talked to the people who were doing that. And what they discovered was a very simple thing, namely that the actual schedulers would make certain high-level decisions which amounted to fixing certain variables. And then once those high-level decisions had been made, then they would, from that, make the more detailed decisions. So what the consultant did was simply to mirror that procedure by developing a heuristic that, that copied, essentially, what the real schedulers were doing and fixed some of the variables, reducing the size of the integer problem, and then attempted to solve that smaller mixed integer programming problem. So the result you will see is on the next page here. They were using Cplex, <coughs> excuse me, Cplex 5.0 at that at this time. It was 90, probably 94, 95. Actually, I may, may have my years slightly wrong here. And what resulted was that, well, you see a solution time here that's about one hour with Cplex 5.0 to solve this particular fixed problem. Now, the machine here that I used was a machine that's a bit faster than the one they were using. The actual solution times they had were more like 12 hours. But that was acceptable, and the application got deployed. One interesting observation is that if you go back, and if you actually try to solve this fixed model with Cplex 4.0, it appears to be impossible. Cplex 4.0 and earlier versions can't solve this problem at all. Okay, moving forward, suppose we take that same model and stick it into a much more recent version of Cplex. In this case, I stuck it into version 11. I would have, um, well, a few years ago I started a new company called 